Hey guys, I have to be quick, but this is how they make the largest tires in the world. Hey everybody, my name is Cole the Corn Star, and you're probably wondering how I got here. This is a big tire, also known as Big Bertha, also known as the MFT 59 AR63 007, also known as the largest tire in the world. See, what happened is moments after I was given level Q security clearance about how to build these things, I, I tried, tried sharing, sharing it with the world, but then Secret Service agent Cole? Are you trying to make up another story about how you stole top secret information about the largest tires in the world? Thanks for spoiling it, Grandma. Okay, Titan Tire invited me to tour six million square feet of their tire building factory facilities. So today, we're gonna learn how they build wheels and tires from lawnmowers to the largest vehicles in the world. And most importantly, once and for all, we are finally going to learn what these little things on the side of tires actually do. We're here with Scott Sloan. I don't really know what he does at Titan Tire, but he works for Titan Tire. I don't know what I do either. He's gonna be giving us a tour of all of their factories. So where are we going? So we're at the Titan Goodyear factory in Freeport, Illinois. We're gonna be in Bryan, Ohio. Then we're gonna to go to our wheel plant in Quincy, Illinois. And then we're gonna end up in Des Moines. In Des Moines, Iowa. The great state of Iowa. Woo. So come on in. So this is the R&D department. So this is where this is the this is the heart of tire technology and advancement in tire technology and tire design right here. Yep, yeah, we made that for you guys. Thank you. Yeah. We can slap that inside of a tire. We well, uh, it's funny, so we were talking, you know, you guys been talking you know, you know, oh can we get something on the sidewall? Can we do all that? Well we, we got Justin kinda playing around a little bit on our 3D here. Remember you were talking about the when it rolled in the dirt <laughs> yeah. at Goodyear? Can you pull up the, the model? <laughs> yeah, we can put you Wait, right we can, the deck line. What do you think of that? Or we could go one step further. Just make a whole lug oh, with your no. <laughs> <laughs> And that way you've got it everywhere. We can do anything in a row. You know, honestly, in all seriousness, what we'll do is we'll, we'll kind of come up with, you know, attributes that we want, you know, uh, lug to void ratio, what applications is it going to go into, like a more of an industrial hard surface or uh, more of an ag, softer uh, um, softer soils or things like that. And so uh, these guys will throw together, you know, we'll throw a bunch of stuff up on the wall and start looking through drawings and, and just deciding what we think is going to work best from what we've known in the past works and what doesn't work. Safety glasses on, check, check. <laughs> Safety glasses, not chocolates. <laughs> Come on, Ryan. Tires are made of four simple components plies, beads, breaker, and tread. Mix these things together, throw it in an oven, and then we have ourselves a tire. But unlike a box of Betty Crocker brownies, building a tire is not that easy because we have to build all the components from scratch, and that starts at the Banbury. A Banbury mixes the non-productive rubber, the master batches are mixed with more chemicals and heated up where it's turned into a productive rubber. This is what's called an unproductive rubber, or simply rubber that does not have the properties required for tires. Think of unproductive rubber like flour. If I mixed in some sugar, eggs, butter, and chocolate chips and mix this together, I would get cookie dough. So if the unproductive rubber is like flour, if we mix that unproductive rubber with some other chemicals and other products and we mix it together, we can turn it into a world-class tire. So the Banbury is essentially just a giant mixing bowl for rubber. The Banbury has a what we call a Masabi system which controls the chemicals and the weight of the rubber. And that will not clear until you're within two pounds. You oh, have wow. to be within that two pounds of that master batch. And then his chemicals are the same way. And now it will start mixing it. The ram comes down, it heats it up to whatever temperature the spec requires it to be, say 215. And then it drops out the bottom, the door will open up and it drops out the bottom, goes into a roller die, and the roller die will run it out into a strip. This is coming out productive now. So what he does, he'll take seven samples for every skid. He'll take a sample just like that. So the, all those samples that they just took come in here, and these are what we call rheometers. Hey, what do you, do not press buttons. Do not press buttons. What this machine does is there's two 
two dies in here that come together. So we take the sample of rubber here, it feeds into the machine, and it clamps down, and those, those two dies oscillate. And as the rubber cures out, it takes more torque to, to oscillate, and that each rubber has its own specific like footprint or uh, fingerprint that it has to meet certain gates as it goes through this. This is called a rheometer curve or the cure rate. If it doesn't pass, maybe we'll have to rework it. It's like, I always use the uh, analogy of baking cookies. You know, you don't have enough brown sugar in it. We can go back in and run it through the Banbury again and add whatever it was maybe missing, you know, maybe a little more brown sugar. We have now made our key ingredient for the basic components of the tire. Now it's time to run that productive rubber through the calendar machine to make our plies. The calendar machine is relatively simple. The new productive rubber gets melted down and then a rolling pin comes and flattens it out. Then the body ply, the piece of nylon, gets laid on top of that and then another layer of productive rubber that was rolling pinned gets put on top and then another big rolling pin that they call a roller die smashes all this stuff together just like an Oreo cookie and then now we have a ply. So this is the nylon. So this is the actual body plies of the tire. And you can see it's actually a it's actually a, a cable. It's actually twisted. So we actually specify the size of cord that we use in a tire. So we order three this is called a denier. The size of that cord is called denier. We we order three different kinds. One that if you put it on a tensometer it breaks it like 35 to the side. Another one breaks at like 47, another one breaks at 72. And then within those deniers, then we order different end counts. So if you want to go from a four ply tire to a six ply tire, people think we just put two more plies in the tire. But in actuality, all you probably are doing is either adding more end count or maybe using stronger fabric just to get the same thing. Now that they got their productive rubber, they bring it over to this machine. It essentially pulls it in there, heats up the rubber, it kind of kneads it, and it passes over the top of these conveyors. It gets kneaded up again into an even finer material, and then it gets cut into these strips, and then taken down the conveyor over to this machine. This is all fabric. It's, it's actually kind of warm right now. You can tell all the fabric gets heated up, so the rubber sticks to it when it's coming through. <laughs> oh, that's so cool. This is fabric that has rubber infused. The rubber is on the bottom side of it. Yeah, see, that's the rubber coming over. That's productive rubber. Oh, wow, that's warm. Very warm. About 215. You got hands of steel to hold on to no, that. because we've done it for oh, years. Yeah. See, we've done this for years. This Oreo cookie effect, or the calendar machine, is used to make several other things for the tire, such as breaker, where they'll take the nylon out and they'll put in Kevlar, they'll put in steel belting, or they can use it for other processes, such as making the inner liner. Well, you can kind of see the cord in there, so I just... Oh yeah, there is the cord. See? That's, that's the cord. And then the, 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 the fun fact about this is, is that there's, it's tacky. So if you stick it to itself... Oh yeah! So that's why you have that cloth in between, yep. otherwise it would do this exact thing. But, but you want it tacky so that it sticks to itself when you're building it, everything sticks together. But you don't want it too tacky, because if it's too tacky then it's like fly paper. Mm -hmm. Everything sticks together and it's a mess. So now what we're going to do is we're going to take it over into our banners, and these are actually, it's actually going to get cut into, a, cut into whatever tire is going to go into. Do I have to go in there? We take the rows of material that came out of our calendaring process, we run it through this line, and what we do here is we're cutting it at an angle specified to the tire that's gonna go into. That angle is very critical when it comes to tire manufacturing. That angle on the finished product determines the overall growth of the tire. So now our Oreo cookie calendar roll has been cut to look like this. Notice how the nylon runs at an angle. Well, we need to make this into a carcass. But before we can make it into a carcass, we need to make a bead. The bead serves two purposes. The first one is to help the carcass maintain its shape. And then once the tire's been built, the bead is the part that runs right along the edge of the wheel. So this needs to be really strong because the bead is what's responsible for keeping the seal between the wheel. And that's what keeps the air inside the tire. So that baby needs to be strong. So this big old Charlie in the Chocolate Factory looking you know, I don't even know what we'd want to call this thing. What is this machine called? Uh, this, this is a uh, 
just a bead unit. Remember the wigwag? This product came off there and then it, it cuts it into pieces. Our rubber's going into there. So then we got all of our wires coming from our machine concoction. It gets mixed with the rubber, so we got raw wire coming in there, and then it's mixed with the rubber here, so the, the wires are now inside of the rubber, and it ends up on the final wheel, and then they have the spools over there. So just like with the calendar machine Oreo cookieing fabric, this time we have our wire come into the side, and it's getting Oreo cookied when it goes through the roller die in between the rubber. So those individual wires are inside of here, and then we have multiple layers. So they just keep rolling it, rolling it, rolling it until it's the thickness it needs to be. Now it's time to slap the beads onto the ply to make a carcass. So this is 16924 high traction lug tire. You put a bead here and you put a bead here. That first sheet right there, you see the shining? Yep, that's, that's the inner liner. That's the built-in inner tube and a tubeless tire. This particular tire is a four ply, so that means he will wrap four layers. Notice how with each ply, he grabs from a different spot. The first reason he is doing this is because the fabric inside runs at an angle. After two plies, he wraps two more plies that run the opposite direction. This X pattern allows the plies to be strong. The second reason he grabs from a different spot is the plies get narrower as they go. This allows the turnover seam to spread out so there's not a weak spot in the carcass. The width of the whole oh, yeah, thing yeah, yeah. is narrower is what so you're saying. He... He set the beads, and then the bladders are going to come in. And that's the turn up. So it's going to turn up around. Now it's locking that bead into that carpet. Now that the turn up has been set to lock the bead, we need to add another ply in order to lock the turn up. So now he's going to put, put the fourth ply on. This is called a down ply. And he's applying the shaper. And this is a square woven material. This is actually what's going to ride on the rim. How heavy is that? 45 pounds, 50 pounds. That's one tire. That's one tire. And you repeat the cycle over and over again all day. How many tires can you do in a day? On this tire, I'm not going to say because Strauss is over here, <laughs> but I can do more than the race. Big tires, such as the LSW 1250 and up, are too big to fit on a drum machine, so a special unit called a mechanical expander is used to apply plies. This is what they refer to as a mechanical expander. We actually have a band room. We have the luxury of building the bands, which are put on a table and sent our way. We're gonna stitch that, and that's gonna work from the center out and get that band adhered to the carcass below. It's like putting the, the screen on a cell phone, like a protector. Exactly and when you, when you push the air bubbles out. The carcass is now ready for breaker, treading, and sidewall. Yeah, they just loaded up the carcass. And so then they're gonna mount this on we're there. We're gonna drop this steel belt. There's two steel belts. The wires crisscross each belt. One, one goes this way and one goes so there's, this way. There's two layers, there's two layers right around that. that. So that's gonna slide out into this unit yep. and then it just follows this track yeah. right over to there. I'm gonna do that right now. So what they're doing is they're just gonna put it over here, expand it, and then throw the rubber on around it. You're good to go. That's the big boy right there. I mean, that's the world's largest ag tire rolling up right now. It literally looks like they have a hay bale wrapped in black plastic yeah, up there. Yeah, I don't think it's the same thing. I actually don't tell bed. anybody, but that's what it is. <laughs> I, honestly, is this anything like you thought it was going to be? No. So they put sidewall on, or that's already on, nope. right? Okay, so now this is what we call sidewall or tread. So what they're, they're putting the tread compound on right now, and you can kind of see it working its way across the profile. Yep. When that's done, they're gonna swap out the strip that goes to the applicator, and they're gonna put the sidewall compound in, and then they're gonna strip wind the sidewall on. That'll be the last step. So they tread it, then sidewall it, and then it's ready to go to the curing press. Curing yep. press. We come over to this machine. So we have a skid of productive rubber. It's fed through a conveyor again into this blue unit. I think they call these extruders. But basically, we have cool productive rubber. It gets mashed up into there. This is basically like a hamburger grinder, but it's hot. It ends up coming out the other side to a nice little tube. This looks like toothpaste when it comes out of a new tube. But it goes up this machine over to this robot, which is treading 
the tire. So when our toothpaste tube, if you call it, comes down, it comes into the top of the robot. And this is actually a die. What gets wrapped around the other side onto the tire is a nice flat, it's angled on whatever this die has it set at. And we control this shape very closely. I mean, because we don't get paid by the pound, we get paid by the tire. So if we made 70,000 Skissier tires and we threw two extra pounds of rubber on 70,000, that's 140,000 extra pounds of rubber going out the back door that we're not getting credit for. And that's whatever, $2 a pound or whatever it is. That's a lot of money. The, the cost accounts calls that material usage variance. And you don't like that. You don't like that. Because now you got to find out where it went. So controlling the process is, is key here. And what this machine does is when he puts the tire on the machine, it actually is on load cells and it weighs that carcass. And then when he treads it, it takes a snapshot and weighs the total tire. And it'll it'll make an adjustment on how much weight it adds or takes so out. So you actually designed this unit yourself? Me and another guy, yep. Wow. I didn't think you're that smart. So this tire is going to sit for a couple hours and cool down, and then it's going to go into a curing press. So the thing to keep in mind is all that process that we just saw. No matter if it's a lawnmower tire, ATV tire, or maybe a, a big 1100 LSW, it all had to go through that equipment, right? So it, it had to be touched by that that machine in order for it to even get to be in the tire. So you know, you think about the amount of overhead and the cost that like, you know, a tire factory has to carry just to produce a tire. We could, this plant could do nothing but produce ATV tires all day long, but you still gotta pay for all that. And that's where, you know, uh, some people are better than others at, at uh, controlling that. So all these are stacked, these are treaded, and then where are we going next? Curing. What's this unit up here? It's a boiler. That's the boiler? That's hot water and steam for us. So that's the steam that goes inside the bladder in the mold. You're a pro at this, absolutely. Oh my goodness, there's a lot going on down there. You know how all that works, right? Absolutely. So this is where all the services from the powerhouse come in. Your 400 cold water, your 400 hot water, your 215 steam, your reduced steam to 70 PSI for dome pressure steam. All that going through these valves. And they go in through solenoids that activate the back valve to turn on the pressure when it's getting called for during the cure cycle. If I were to buy, let's say, everything we're looking at here nowadays, got any ballpark? Probably 1.75 to 2 and a quarter mil. For everything here? For one press. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, we are looking at the birthing of a brand new LSW 1400 coming out of this press. There's no tire in that press right now. There's not? We're gonna put one in. Oh. All right, we're in the conception process of a 1400 yes. right now. So one thing unique about our tires, they're all serialized. So every tire gets a, gets a serial number put on it. So that, that, that number you see on the side of all your tire on your yep. tractor, that goes back to the birth certificate, we call it, which we can track back to how it was built. And if there's any building defects or any, if anything came up during the build process, we take notes on it. So if you ever have issues with it, then we come back to the same. Was there already have documentation on that specific tire? So what nationality is this particular tire? Uh, Indonesian rubber. <laughs> how long does it take to cure this thing in there? About four and a half hours. Four and a half hours. What about that big, big tire? Big Bertha. Big Bertha, let's call it. That was about, that's about 18 hours, I believe. <laughs> and that's the birth certificate. That's the serial number for the birth certificate. Oh, he's going to lay that in the press. It just gets laid down in the bottom. The biggest thing you got to make sure it stays out of all the lettering. Oh, there, yeah, you're right. That is the lettering yep. there. So you got the bottom half of this, a clamshell mold, right? So you got the bottom half and then the top half comes together. And, and then this guy in here, this is the bladder. So when they put this in, it actually sits over the top, so the hollow spot inside the tires where that goes. That fills up with steam, and basically, I better get out of the way. But it shapes the tire out, and then it heats it up from the inside out, as well as the outside in, so that way they can get a full vulcanization process and make the tire. So once this closes and opens up in four and a half hours, then we are going to have an LSW 1400 as the product. How hot is this? Uh, what is it, the 330 degree cure. So <laughs> I'll give you a dollar if you can hold your hand on there for one minute. So these little things here 
are actually where the air bleeds out inside of there, right? Because I was always told when I was little, this is how they injected the rubber into the mold. That's what I said. It's a different process than I thought it would be when I Yeah. I see he's in there with the spray bottle right now. Do you have to clean it after every tire? Or? If you've got an air wand, you'll have some like a rubber residual that could fall in the bottom of the mold. So you got to blow that out. So what happens if you lose electricity? Do you have a generator? We do have a backup generator, uh, but it only powers so much. So we, we can run the carrying presses, but everything on the north side you guys saw goes down. Once you're in the middle of a carrying, you can't just stop it and then restart again, can you? Nope. Once you're in the middle, you're going through. The best you can do is try and save things. So depending on where it's at in the cure, like if it's, a, you know, maybe on the last 10 minutes of a cure, it shuts down and they'll keep things closed and let the residual heat lengthen it out and hopefully get it. Uh, yeah, power outage is not good for a tire factory at all. Do you design the new ones then that come in or who's all behind them? How does that process work? If, you know, someone comes forward and says, hey, we think there's, you know, a spot in the mining market that needs to be filled. Yep. You know, yep. like, let's say these slicks, like how does that process go about then? So on the off the road side, the, the construction tires, we design our design centers here. So we'll run the calculations, we'll do all the drawings. Um, my office is right on the other side of that wall so we can walk out here to build our prototypes right on the floor. So then once you build it, then you basically have to stress test it and stuff? Yeah. This is a radial fatigue test machine. And this is where we test tires or the rim shell of the wheel. This test will, it destroys tires. It destroys anything. It is a failure test. We are running things to termination to basically find out what the limits of everything is. So I just recorded a whole like 15 minutes here and forgot to turn the recorder on. So now you don't get to see my genuine reaction to this thing, but check it out. <laughs> All right, dad, do, do the thing. Climb up on top and then you can run up there like the log Gerbil. spinning. Gerbil. <laughs> there you go. I'm pushing. <laughs> this machine can push in at half a million pounds. Half a million pounds. So that would be for something like that would be some, what that would we're be looking like. Tire, yes. They said we can yeah. turn this machine on if we want to, but we have to go up in that little room, and that's a bulletproof glass up there. Can we really turn it on, though? Can turn it on. Okay. I'll let you flip Don't the tell me twice. All right, we'll go upstairs. I can press the button. Yeah, click, just click that on. <laughs> that, that's all it is. <laughs> that's it. <laughs> on. Once it, we hit top speed here, it'll just continuously do this until that tire fails. How fast will this machine go? How fast? 40, 42. Oh, wow. <laughs> we can make that tire go 42 an hour if we want to at half a million pounds. How long would that tire last? Um, I think the rim, it, the tire would be out of the picture. It'd be running on the rim by the time it got to a half a million pounds. So we did about 200 rotations with the 1250 and it blew up. What happened? Yeah, Scott, <laughs> Scott's got to redo it all over again. <laughs> so how often are you doing these kind of tests then? We're basically running, I mean, we're running 24 seven because this can run unmanned. I can watch it from my cell phone and make sure everything's running fine in the evenings. Mm -hmm. Weekends, we'll come in and take a look, see what's going on, just kind of make sure everything's fine. Um, we're probably running a couple tires a month depending on if so do you just like on. pull random ones from the line and say like okay we've made 2000 tires just pull one off see how stuff's looking or no, is it with just new it's, tires it's new. typically it's always new it's new stuff it's whatever the tire plants so des moines freeport and brian whatever they want to test they create test plans and then they ship us the tires so essentially what you're saying is that 1250 we're looking at has something new going on on the inside of it that it might we're be yep. testing yep. it might Mike. That was a good answer. You'd be a good politician. <laughs> so then you have a, a something blow out on it. You gotta go back to the drawing right. board, figure out what you did wrong. Yep, they ship it back here. We got a 10 foot band saw. We'll cut through it. I'd like to get Cooper on this saw and do that, you know, where they cut the lady in half. We're gonna lay him on the table and then we're gonna run him through that band saw. Now over here, this is where they make the big boys, the big tires. This is the home. Of Big Bertha. I can't do a lot of filming because they are reconfiguring how they're making these mining tires. But this is the side where they do the mining yep. stuff. This is where they make the largest tire in the world, or yep. where the largest tire in the world was made. Yep. Right here. The exact same well, process. Same yep. 
of what we just went through goes into this, it's just a lot bigger. bigger. Yeah, this is uh, one of our newest tires, 4057. It's a bias, the 78 ply rated uh, tire, so the highest ply rating in the industry. Holy, um, so this is a brand new tire. Yes, yep. Uh, goes on like at steel mills, the big pot haulers or the uh, slab carriers, uh, big press equipment. So um, it was on the rear end. So you're basically carrying the sun, the molten steel, and yeah. dumping it out with these. So <laughs> usually the sidewalls about burn off before the tread wears off. And we're talking like a, lo a lot of sidewall here. Four beads and then the most amount of plies of any tire. It takes a whole roll of that material that you saw. There. These are the final stations where every tire that comes through the factory comes through. There is nothing between here and the customer. So they are respected. They are last people that will touch the tires before it goes to the warehouse and before it goes to the, the, to the, uh, to the customer. And how they know what's good, what's bad, we have our written standards that are showing them, you know, this is, you know, how, what's acceptable, what's not acceptable. And a lot of this comes, you know, from the customer's perception with what they want. It's not really, and then some of them, you know, come from manufacturing recommendations too. But, you know, tire can be only good or bad. So if it's good, goes up the belt to the warehouse of customers. If it's bad, we have a system where we have enter everything in, and a minute they enter in and submit, every supervisor in the plant get information about particular tire, particular issue, and everybody jumping on that to try to solve the issue so we don't know. You know, like if you get one bad tire per week, what happens to that tire then? They remelt it down or is it just shredded up and gone? That all depends. If the, uh, there are some tires, like you can see back, back over there, you know, they have minor defects, oh, surface stubborn. defects, you know, they will just pop them, you know, make them, you know, presentable. Right. Uh, some of them, uh, I don't have any of them, and they had two earlier, before, uh, uh, they have a scrap label, they will be scrapped, with be shredded, so we don't use them. So they have, you know, different type of defect, you know, it's more like, you know, if you put them on track, they're going to fail, 100%. Right. So okay. we don't want that. Even you know some defects, you know the customers who see it, you know we're going to scrap them because, and we know the tires not going, it's going to fit for and functions of tires going to work, but you know it looks ugly. Appearance of the tires not good, so we just scrap them too. I guess the way you got everything layered, you really couldn't melt it down and reuse it. It just didn't nah, need... not really. Yeah. I mean we don't sell blend. We sell only first class. That's cool. That's... Yeah. It's... I know we uh, in the past we had a customer they were not really happy about it because they want to buy, you know, sometimes for cheaper, but... Right, but well, you're paying for the quality. Exactly. And we, you know, we're paying a lot of attention to the quality. Ah, yeah, this is the smell I'm used to, the tire shop. The, the, the farm and fleet smell, right? Yes. So what's this? Oh, that's our run-out machine. Run-out machine, what does that do? Uh, so you'll put the tire on there and you'll find the low spot in the tire. Oh, so and they... then we match that to the high spot on the rim there and then we get go. a smoother ride. Yeah. Oh boy, it's like a big old slide. Oh, holy cow, it's cooking. Yeah. Boom. How long is something, the typical tire, let's say, in this warehouse before it gets shipped out? Uh, we do about uh, 14 turns a year. You know, this, is the, this is the largest tire that we produce. We don't particularly this size anymore, but we got one that's just a step under that that so we're going to see. This is the largest. Well, how there isn't. This is the biggest this one. Is it. This, this is the single biggest tire in the world. Literally from the ground to the bead is to my hip. The open tread pattern provides excellent traction. <laughs> <laughs> That's literally almost the size of a hip. Scott, if I bought a monster truck, would you sponsor them tires on there? Which one? Which tires? Those big ones. The those big ones. The 63 inch? Yeah. You build a truck big enough for that, I'd give you a set of those. Hey, Scott. What would it take for me to get my signature molded into one of these? And you go by the Cornstar edition. You know what? Everything can be bought, right? Yeah. So, <laughs> hey, remember our what does it take? About margin? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> so once it's got a sticker on it, it's done here. It's, it's done. It's ready. These are ready to. These are actually ready to get mounted now. So. Oh, you these mount are, here? Yep, that's where we're headed right now. So all of our LSWs. Our, we sell as mounted assemblies. We also do a lot of mounting for a lot of the OEs like John Deere Case, uh, uh, Kubota, um, no. Bobcat. This factory shut down right now. 
of making tires, how long would it take to empty all these tires out? At the rate things are going now, if everything was wanted, uh, we'd be out in probably two, three days. Oh, we got more tires. And more tires. And more tires. And what is this? That's our Zamboni. Has anyone ever knocked over one of these rows and then it just knocked everything Never. else over? Never. Find some wood to knock on now. So, what do we know about this place? We know we make a lot of wheels here. How uh, many wheels? Well, thousands a day. Scott, how many wheels do we make here? A lot. <laughs> <laughs> All right, let's certify you to get in here. Low. Oh boy, All right, I was just outside. <laughs> Try it again. Okay, now we're back. So this is about 80 acres of plant here? Yes. Yeah, we're spread out over 80 acres. Um, we've got a lot of warehouse space on that 80 acres, but we're gonna, we'll just go through the main manufacturing plant, which is basically 1.6 million square foot under roof. So this is raw material right That's here? raw material, yep. So okay. we're, we're taking possession of master coil from a steel mill. That's what Grandpa John used to do. He used to drive coiled steel to different factories. So that load very well could have came from Grandpa John back in the day. So we got the raw coils here. And they're gonna bring them across. Oh, this guy dropped his phone. We're gonna bring it over to this machine. And it's gonna coil it up into circles. That's what we're gonna be passing right here. Once the master coil gets cut into its desired piece, a machine bands it up, and then the next one grabs it and welds it together. The rim carries on down the assembly line, and it goes through a series of roller presses that help build the contour of the rim. So from each press, another contour is added until we have the contour of the outer part of the rim. The whole time that rim's been running down and we're getting that contour shape, we're now gonna expand it. So you see these pie-shaped segments? It's gonna stretch that rim. So if we were to take that rim off and try to mount a tire to it right now, the tire would slip. You would have no bite into the tire into that rim. So here we're actually stretching it. If you could actually reach in there, you feel that rim expand just a little bit. We're stretching that steel to get it to size. Then it passes down to a machine that will put in the hole for the valve stem. And then it goes to the end of the line for inspection and measurement. And then it gets put in a pile so it can be taken away for storage. Yep. And then in this row of presses, they're making, making the this. Major disc components, yep. So it starts out with just a flat sheet about that thick. You set it on there and it goes through this series of presses. And then each time it goes through a press, it gets a new dimple in it. So it went through flat, comes out looking like this. And then when it comes to the next one, this one punches out the holes, so that way it can be mounted on to the tractor. So now we have the holes in it. By this point, the outside of the wheel's done. The disc has been pressed out and built. So we need to stick those two together, weld them, get that inspected, and then it's ready to be painted. This is all sold. So everything you see here is not for inventory. It's, it's bought, sold, it already has a place to go. It's just waiting to be scheduled. Everything we've looked at here has been sold already. Yep. That's a little bit different from the tire side. So like what Mark was talking about in the beginning, the aftermarket versus OE, this is already scheduled. This is already planned for. They don't, they don't build it unless it's sold. So right, you're just in time. We're just in time delivery, yep. Wow. And sometimes just, 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 in, just, time. just in time. So everything gets staged over in this area. We have thousands of wheels over here. Next is gonna go to paint or powder coating. We got all of the wheels that loaded up coming in here and we can see they just keep snaking through. It's a whole snake of assembly line going on. So what we have here is the washer and the, and the e-coat systems parallel with each other. This is, the, this is the washing system here that's cleaning off all the oil and the grit and the dirt. You can see the different stages. And it finally does an iron phosphate is one of the final final uh, preparations that goes before a, a DNI, deionized or a reverse osmosis rinse to make it very clean and ready to take on the eco. I wonder what color they're painting them right now. Uh, hard to say. <laughs> this is a special kind of paint they're putting on there. It's called powder coat. Essentially, the gentleman inside of here is spraying a powder onto the wheels, and then they're going to end up running it through an oven and then the oven basically melts that powder down and turns it into a nice, tough enamel. And they call that powder coating. Notice how the wheel's kind of got a matte color to it. It's not shiny like we typically see. Once we end up running it through the oven, 
That's when it'll get its gloss to it. We're looking at the start of the oven here. They go in haggy orange, then they come out silver. They actually just switched to painting these haggy wheels right when we pulled up. So these are just starting to get in. Then they just got done doing some case wheels. So that's why they're going in yellow and coming out silver. For that wheel to become this wheel, it's gonna be inside the oven for two hours. So it's gonna have some time in there. strapped down this is ready to be shipped so I learned something that the pallets can tell you where it's going so this one's a metal pallet so this one's probably gonna be shipped off to another Titan location where they're gonna mount a tire on it but then we have these ones over here these ones are encased with heat treated woods these are actually going overseas these particular ones behind me are gonna be going to Germany they have to heat treat it so that way it passes customs basically ensures that there's no bugs inside this wood that could be brought over to another country. And all these ones over here that are just strapped to a normal pallet, these are gonna be staying right here in the United States of America. I just don't get how all these are sold. It's crazy, isn't it? He said everything we've looked at today has already been sold. Yeah, I, don't, I don't get it. They get much new stuff out there, but this is a lot of tractors. So they're feeding us all the wheels. We're taking mostly our own tires from here putting everything together for our customer orders. So what do you mean mostly your own tires? We do mount for um, other brands of tires too. So, so this is actually a mounting facility. So uh, we mount for say John Deere or uh, whoever. It's all business. The business is our business. Right. So this is essentially a, a factory completely separate of where we just were. Absolutely. Pretty much. Didn't you guys put the rest of the air that's needed in the tire? Yeah, through here. And then the, uh, the computer reads it and senses when there's, and then when there's a green light, let's say noise ready. And that's mounting. That's it. Then out the door it goes. I didn't think Scott was ever going to let us go. <laughs> <sighs> I'm tired.